On May 2, 2014, rumors began to spread across the web regarding a new game with the working title of Project Beast. Soon after, screenshots of Project Beast started to surface, sparking discussions on the NeoGAF forum. The gaming community was buzzing with excitement, especially because one of these screenshots prominently featured the From Software logo. It had only been a month since the console release of Dark Souls 2 and just two weeks since its PC release, yet the community was already eagerly anticipating a new addition to the Souls games. Their excitement reached new heights three weeks later when a leaked video trailer of Project Beast started circulating online. The leaked trailer undeniably confirmed that the mysterious game known as Project Beast was indeed a collaborative project between Sony and From Software, causing the Souls community to celebrate and go into a frenzy. A journalist commenting on the leaked video stated, Ladies and gentlemen, the hype is real. Most of the footage in the tantalizing teaser shows off areas that we already encountered in the screenshots, and the quality of the video itself is absolutely abysmal but that certainly hasn't stopped us from praising the sun in excitement. With one of the biggest gaming events on the horizon, E3 2014, fans were filled with sky-high anticipation and expectations of a guaranteed official reveal from both Sony and from software. Fortunately, the two companies didn't disappoint. On the night of June 9, 2014, during Sony's E3 presentation, Bloodborne was unveiled to the world for the first time. But Little Big Planet 3 is just one of the great variety of titles that our Worldwide Studios teams are developing for PS4. And tonight, I get the honor of introducing a completely new IP from one of the industry's most respected game, game directors. This is a project that is very dear to my heart if you know me and our history with the developer. Welcome to the world of Bloodborne.
The trailer reveal sparked a surge of excitement and anticipation among Souls fans. Here are some comments from various forums where fans shared their enthusiasm. I don't know about you guys, but what's really hitting home for me right now is the overall theme of the trailer. The gothic, undead, spooky vibes and the music are all pushing the right buttons. My body is ready. Oh my goodness, I just watched the Bloodborne trailer and I'm absolutely speechless. From Software has truly outdone themselves with this one. I'm going to dive into this game headfirst and I know I'll be terrified, but darn it, I'm playing this game. I've been eagerly awaiting this moment and the Bloodborne trailer did not disappoint. It's the biggest game that came out of the conference for me. I can already tell that I'm going to sink my teeth and a lot of time into this beast of a game. On June 10th, the following day, there was an explosion of information regarding the highly anticipated game, Bloodborne, as it was prominently featured in Famitsu magazine. This Famitsu article emerged as one of the most reliable early sources of information about the upcoming game. As expected, the community promptly began gathering all available information about Bloodborne. Unknown to most fans, Bloodborne's gameplay was privately shown on June 10th to select journalists in one of the closed-door sessions at E3 2014. Here is Kyle Prawl, one of the few lucky people who got the chance to watch the exclusive reveal of the actual gameplay. What's up, PlayStation Universe? This is senior editor Kyle Prawl, bringing you impressions of the game I just saw at Sony's booth, Bloodborne. Now, I know you saw Bloodborne during Sony's press conference last night, but I was fortunate enough to see about 30 minutes of live gameplay uh, played by the game's director, uh, Miyazaki, with From Software. Now, they clarified for me that this game is being produced by Japan Studio and still developed by From Software, so you're getting the same, uh, you're getting the same Demon Souls, Dark Souls type action that you've grown to love, but it's coming from Sony exclusively. Uh, importantly, though, it's not the same Dark uh, Demon Souls you remember. Uh, they made a very strong point that uh, Bloodborne is more aggressive than Demon Souls. It takes a proactive approach to combat versus sort of the defensive uh, wait and see type of game that you that you play with with Demon Souls. But we saw 30 minutes of gameplay. And uh, we, we watched the hero or the main character move through the city of, I wrote it down here, uh, Bjarnum, uh, which is very 19th century, very gothic. Uh, you got a sense of that in the trailer a little bit, but it's, it's absolutely true uh, in, in gameplay respects as well. Although it was improper and unbecoming of the invitees, one of them broke the rule of not taking photographs or videos at the event and recorded a full minute of gameplay. Of course, within a matter of minutes, this footage was again leaked and spread online, especially on gaming forums. I, I don't know what kinds of exact weapons they Things were. Things to stab and gouge. Indiscriminate, yes. like, slashing weapons. And they would, uh, they would come at you. There was actually kind of a boss battle at the end that was really, really impressive. Um, big thing came, comes swooping over like a castle type area and uh, just lands in front of your ground shakes. And this thing looks... I, I, I have defense. I saw a lot of rolling around in the in the in the combat. Rather than you know, in Dark Souls, you would hold a shield, wait for the enemy to attack, they stagger, and then you go after them. But in this, it's just all attack. It's finding strategic ways to attack the enemy. And again, what we saw was very short, so I can't speak to the the final product. But based on what we saw, it looks like uh, uh, fans of From Software's games will kind of have an idea what they're getting into. On that same day, Masaki Yamagiwa. The producer of Bloodborne from Sony's Japan studio made a significant post on the PlayStation blog. He shared, Bloodborne is a new collaboration for us, being developed by From Software and produced by SCE Japan Studio. This game will transport players to a dark and terror-filled gothic world, a world full of deranged beings and nightmarish creatures. Yamagiwa also unveiled the first official in-game screenshots. It's worth noting that only a few days had passed since the leaked Project Beast video and screenshots surfaced. Nevertheless, the stark contrast in quality between these official screenshots and the leaked images suggests that the leaked materials originated from much older versions of the game. What's particularly noteworthy is a message from Hidetaka Miyazaki just before the conclusion of the blog post. Miyazaki said, Creating Bloodborne as a completely new game on the new PlayStation 4 hardware has allowed us to really push the envelope in myriad ways. That being said, in more ways than one, it also very much retains our distinct, signature style. As has been at the core of our development philosophy since Demon's Souls, we make true games for people who love games. Please watch for more to come on Bloodborne, and thank you very much for your support. In a sense, Miyazaki's words regarding pushing boundaries proved prophetic. 
Not only did the PlayStation 4 enable this new game to achieve unprecedented technological heights, but it also significantly expanded the Souls game's reach to a wider audience. Bloodborne marked Miyazaki's first game to capture the attention of mainstream players, thanks to innovations in combat and significant improvements in graphics. It stood as one of the initial exclusive titles available on the newly launched PlayStation 4. This is the story of the making of Bloodborne and how it brought forth the creative genius of Hidetaka Miyazaki, crafting one of the greatest Lovecraftian games. Join me as we explore its creation and uncover the fascinating journey behind Miyazaki's third masterpiece. In September 2011, at the age of 37, Hidetaka Miyazaki witnessed the release of his second dark fantasy game, titled Dark Souls, to both commercial and critical acclaim. It was so successful that it exceeded the one-year international sales of Demon's Souls in just one week, solely based on Japanese sales alone. Miyazaki remarked, The success of Dark Souls was truly astonishing to me because I didn't anticipate it at all. It's hard to put into words just how unpredictable and surprising it was for me. I can only describe it as a massive shock. Following the release of Dark Souls, the game received widespread acclaim and was voted as the best game of the year by various websites and publications. Initially, the game's release was limited to consoles, and Souls fans across the internet were eagerly requesting a PC port. To provide context for the situation at the time, here's a message from one of the fans. Anecdotal evidence may not be the best argument, but among all the PC gamers I know, I have yet to hear one who wouldn't buy this game instantly if it were available on PC. And you know what? RPGs are one of the few genres that thrive on the platform. Just look at Skyrim's sales or how Risen managed to sell more on PC than on Xbox 360. I may be naive, but I really can't see this game failing in any way if they go for Steam. Unless From Software actually hates to work on PC games, I wonder what's there to lose. The demand for a PC version was so loud that an admin on the Bandai Namco forums took notice and suggested that the community create a petition. A petition was indeed launched in the first week of January 2012, and it quickly gained momentum, going from a few hundred to thousands of signatures. In less than 18 hours, the petition reached 20,000 signatures, and by the third day, it had already reached 53,000. To the community's surprise, on April 2012, Bandai Namco officially announced the PC port, named Prepare to Die Edition. Notably, within the press release, there was a message from Hidetaka Miyazaki to the community. Our fans demanded to see this game brought to the PC, and the noise they have made was simply too loud and too passionate to ignore. This also allowed us to dive back into the world of Dark Souls, offering a special edition of the game that offers more ways to die over and over again than ever before. Adding a whole new chapter to tell the tale of the Dark Knight Artorias was an opportunity we're also proud to have taken, as we've managed to expand the experience for our biggest fans without compromising the balance of the core game that we worked so hard to create. This edition of the game is our gift to the fans. You might be wondering why this information is relevant to the development of Bloodborne. It's important because it allows us to narrow down the exact month when the development of Bloodborne commenced. Additionally, it provides further context for those who have followed the making of Dark Souls 2. As established earlier, the development of the sequel began in September 2011, the same month as the release of Dark Souls, and four months before the Souls community's petition for a PC port, and seven months before the announcement of the Prepare to Die edition. Now, let's uncover the starting point of Bloodborne's development. In an interview, Miyazaki revealed, the project for Bloodborne started in 2012. I believe it was before the announcement of the PS4, and it began with an offer from Sony Computer Entertainment, asking, would you like to create a new game on the new hardware? At that time, I had just completed the development of the Artorias of the Abyss version of Dark Souls, and was keen on working with the new hardware and collaborating with SCE again. So, I responded enthusiastically, saying, please let us do it. Based on this collected data, we can establish a timeline, placing the start of Bloodborne's development around July 2012. Continuing the earlier interview, Miyazaki elaborated, The prospect of working on something entirely new and with new hardware was highly appealing to us, so we were very enthusiastic about taking on the project. The interviewer then inquired, So, it was decided from the outset that it would be developed for the PS4. 
To this, Miyazaki responded, Yes, that was the plan from the very beginning. When asked if the new game was related to Demon Souls, Miyazaki clarified, No, it's a different game. As I mentioned earlier, the initial proposal was to create a new game. We never considered making a sequel to Demon Souls or anything of the sort. While both Demon Souls and this game have me as the director, and in that sense, they may appear similar, they are distinct titles. Miyazaki served as the director of Bloodborne, and when asked about the nature of his role, he explained, I was responsible for overseeing the development process. To put it somewhat grandly, my role involved establishing the concept, designing and controlling various elements that constitute the game as a whole, and bringing the game to life in alignment with that concept. Personally, I was in charge of game system design, fundamental balance, level design encompassing maps and enemies, world building, design work, text work, and a few more aspects. I collaborated with team members in these areas to directly guide the game's direction. Many of us fans are curious about how Miyazaki approaches creating a new game from scratch. While he previously discussed this in the making of Dark Souls, we are fortunate that he revisited this topic in the context of Bloodborne. First and foremost, it was about gameplay, particularly focusing on innovating battles and introducing new elements to the online component. Additionally, it was about crafting a new world that would be conducive to these elements. These aspects were integral right from the early planning stages, and Sony entrusted us with these ideas, so we proceeded with them. I'm grateful that there were no disagreements during the conceptual phase. Something even more intriguing for us is the question, is Bloodborne being developed by an entirely different team from Dark Souls 2? To this, Miyazaki reveals, yes, it's an entirely different team. From Software currently possesses the development resources to handle two so-called high-end games concurrently, and Bloodborne is one of them. We are developing it in parallel with Dark Souls 2. In an interview, the host asked Miyazaki about his approach to assembling a development team for game projects, stating, I'd like to inquire about the development team's staff. When selecting members for the development team, not just for Bloodborne but in general, how do you go about choosing them? Miyazaki explained, At our company from software, we don't employ what you might call a fixed team system. We don't have designated teams like Armored Core Team or Dark Souls Team. Of course, for efficiency purposes, we do have some core members who may remain consistent to a certain extent. However, fundamentally, we have a large From Software team, and we select the most suitable members for each development project. The host followed up with, Are there any specific considerations you have in mind to continually optimize the composition of the members within the large From Software team? Miyazaki replied, First, we assess aptitude and the individual's personal motivation. While we can't always fully account for these factors, it's preferable to have team members with aptitude who are aligned with their own aspirations, as they tend to perform better. Additionally, and particularly since I assumed the role of president, I make an effort to rotate team members to some extent. For example, I might pair experienced veterans with ambitious but less experienced younger members. By doing this, everyone continues to receive a moderate level of stimulation, shares expertise, and I hope that From Software functions as one vibrant, cohesive team, working well together. I'm not fond of rigid and factionalized teams, even within the context of the Souls series. In a smaller company like From Software, we don't see the need for that kind of internal competition. In our previous making of videos, we never learned how Miyazaki pitched Demon Souls to Sony or Dark Souls to Bandai Namco. Fortunately, in the case of Bloodborne, one of the interviewers asked this intriguing question. When you first pitched Bloodborne, how did you describe it? Does the game match up to that original description? Miyazaki explained, The concept and the direction haven't changed since our initial presentation. Some keywords I used to describe this game, such as the sense of fighting for death, have been reflected in the game since the early stages. However, I think what I initially suggested were more like concepts or directions. We tested these with a prototype and retained the elements that were valid and felt realistic, so some of those early ideas did not make it into the final game. With regard to the world of Bloodborne, it was something I had been contemplating for quite some time. Elements like game mechanics, or the gothic theme for instance, were concepts that had been simmering for a while. They were part of the vision I had always wanted to realize in my career, and I knew that when the trigger was pulled, this was it. 
Another intriguing topic related to game development is the question posed by an interviewer about the creation of new IP. The interviewer asked, when From Software creates new IP, how important is it that it recalls the style of previous games, and how do you ensure that it achieves that? Miyazaki explained, we don't typically have the style of previous games in mind when we create new IP. What makes From Software unique is our approach. As gamers, we are enthusiastic about crafting a game that we ourselves would want to play. Naturally, the game's style might end up being similar to a previous one as a result, but we don't consider that a negative outcome. We never set out to intentionally create a similar style of game each time. In our previous video on the making of Dark Souls 2, we learned about Miyazaki's preference for creating new IP to the extent that he concluded the Dark Souls series when he became the company president. In an interview, the host asked him about this very topic, stating, Bloodborne is a completely new title, not a sequel. What do you find exciting about creating a new game rather than a sequel? Miyazaki explained, whether it's a new game or a sequel, game development is incredibly exciting. Given that premise, both new games and sequels have their own unique aspects of excitement. New games are particularly liberating. If necessary, you can completely start from scratch. From the perspective of a director responsible for the overall design of the game, there's a high degree of freedom and ample room for experimentation, and that's what makes it interesting. As early as Demon's Souls, Miyazaki has consistently emphasized his approach to game development, which does not align with a market-driven perspective. He has even advised against blindly copying other games without truly understanding what makes them work, as we learned during our video on the making of Dark Souls. In the context of the development of Bloodborne, the interviewer asked, With each new release, From Software's games have become more popular. When making Bloodborne, did you keep in mind this expanded audience? or are you always making the game for yourselves? Miyazaki explained, I'm very pleased if our games have indeed become more popular, but we don't keep that in mind, and especially not when making Bloodborne. Furthermore, I'm not sure if it's appropriate to say this, but I personally am not a proponent of the market-driven approach. Our philosophy hasn't deviated much since Demon's Souls. And still related to the topic of targeting a market segment for video games, Miyazaki emphasized that his games were not exclusively designed for a small group of hardcore players. Yes, of course, we are thrilled with the response we've received since the first trailer, and there has indeed been a growing popularity for the Souls series over the years. However, I don't like to categorize players. I prefer to create games that are enjoyable for everyone. I don't concern myself with whether they are casual or hardcore gamers, Japanese, European, American, or any other category. While publishers often ask about the target audience for a title, I don't ponder these questions when I create games. I simply aim to craft enjoyable and exciting experiences. The fact that they now appeal to an ever-expanding audience can only bring me joy. The PS3 is known for its unique architecture, which makes game development challenging. Miyazaki shared his insights on this, comparing it to the PS4. He said, As a director, I've had the privilege of leading a PS3 launch title. Looking back, I believe the PS4 has significantly simplified the development cycle. Anyone who worked in the early days would likely agree with me on this point. When it comes to new achievements attributed to the PS4 architecture, there are indeed many. Of course, there's the high-definition graphics and the immersive world-building through various expressions like wind and particles. But as a game director, what made me happy was the significantly increased memory capacity. It was especially helpful for unique systems like the trick weapon system in this game, which can strain memory due to the motions involved. So, that was a big relief. One of the key topics most fans are interested in is Miyazaki's approach to game development. We are fortunate that one interviewer asked this interesting question. He asked, regarding the process of creating Bloodborne, could you tell us what the development process had in common with, for example, Demon's Souls or Dark Souls? or how it's been different. And Miyazaki explained, I wouldn't say it's been that different, but there are two points in particular that come to mind. The first one, which I touched on a little bit just now, is that the director level staff in the company are now all participating in a unified production workflow. As for what I'm leaving to them in particular, one thing we need from the start of the project is the ability to express our concepts and aims in words. When I'm doing all of that by myself, I tend to verbalize the bare minimum necessary, or, to put it in a bad way, 
I tended to procrastinate a lot. I couldn't get away with that here. I think a lot of good came out of that arrangement. Verbalizing it and bringing it out to other people made me notice a lot I wouldn't have otherwise. The Chalice Dungeons, one of the biggest elements we added to this game, are something that came out precisely because I got other people involved in the operation. The other point is the environment that the title and its production team were working within. This marked a major change, with Demon Souls, of course, and while we worked on Dark Souls too, the expectations around us were still pretty low. All around us, there was always the idea that there's no way that something like this will sell. That's no longer the case with Bloodborne, so it's become notably easier to make. We're feeling more pressure at the same time, but even with that, I think it's the kind of environment that makes a game developer happy. We really owe a lot to the gamers who gave so much praise to our previous titles. It's all thanks to them. In his previous response, we can observe that Miyazaki began sharing more information with his team as their projects grew in scale. He explained how he achieved this, saying, At the start of development, we had this forum where I'd write whatever came to mind on a daily basis, and the rest of the team could browse through it. I'd write about topics like the significance of the mind's eye and its limitations on people, or discussions about blood and beast transformations, and a really large amount of other seemingly insignificant things like that, most of which never really made it into the game. Of course, the overarching theme for this game was not to overly reveal the story, much like before, so I believe our approach turned out quite well. Many players have noticed that the doll in the game responds when the player gestures toward her. This interaction is just one of the many positive outcomes of the team's use of the internal forum that Miyazaki mentioned earlier. He explained, I believe that idea emerged from my various musings on the forum, but it was Masaru Yamamura, one of the designers, who actually brought it to life. It was quite a busy period during development, I recall, but he managed to find the time to create it and showed it to me, saying, Hey, Miyazaki, check out this thing I made. Naturally, I gave him the green light immediately. It was all thanks to his efforts. Since the days of Demon's Souls, I've always had challenges coming up with heroines for our games but I genuinely like the character of the doll, including her design. I hope that players who experience the game will feel the same way. When asked about the lessons he learned from developing his previous games, Miyazaki shared a surprising response. He said, While there were numerous lessons learned in various areas, I believe the most crucial knowledge we acquired didn't necessarily come during the actual development process, but rather from the players themselves. This encompasses how they played the game and their overall reactions to the experience. The same can be said for Demon Souls and Dark Souls as well. Aspiring video game creators will find the next topic truly interesting, and even if you're not into game creation and design, it offers insight into life and software development. In an interview, the host asked, It seems like you get that sense of urgency when you're close to a deadline. When was the busiest period during the development of Bloodborne? Miyazaki shared, That would be right before the Goldmaster, around the end of the year and the beginning of the next. It was not an easy development period before that, but I think that was the busiest time. The host followed up with, Why was that? Miyazaki replied, It was our first title for the PS4 generation. Unexpected issues tend to arise towards the end. The first game I directed, Armored Core 4, was also the first title for the PS3 generation. First-generation titles have their own unique challenges and busyness. In that sense, there was a sense of nostalgia in the busyness. The host then asked, I see. During such times, did you ever have to work all night? Miyazaki replied, Yes, that's right. When there's a deadline that absolutely must be met the next day, there have been times when we had to work all night. That's a fact. However, as a general rule, I believe that unless it's a truly exceptional situation, you should avoid working all night. At least it shouldn't become a regular occurrence. Some of the members who were really busy might get angry with me for saying this, but I truly believe it. In general, I think that taking breaks when you need to and resting is important. And for people who create things or want to create something, I believe it's important to have time for inspiration. Earlier, we learned that the PS4 is much easier to program compared to the PS3. However, even with this platform, Challenges in development are unavoidable. In an interview, the host asked, Demon's Souls was a game for the PlayStation 3, but Bloodborne is a title for the PlayStation 4. 
so there was a transition in platforms. Were there any unexpected challenges on the programming side during the development of Bloodborne? Miyazaki replied, The main challenge was, I'd say, the connectivity of the maps. The city of Yarnum, which serves as the backdrop for this game, has a complex structure with intricately connected streets and pathways. It's a bit of an idiosyncrasy in my map design to create a city with such an unusual atmosphere for exploration. But because of that, the host interrupted and said, It took more time? To which Miyazaki continued saying, Yes, I remember that the map connections and data loading were quite challenging. Both the graphic designers and programmers worked very hard. If the maps in this game are good, it's largely thanks to their efforts. Well, if you ask them, they might say, no, there were other parts that were much more challenging. But that's from their perspective, at least that's how I saw it. To conclude our section on game development, the host asked the question, what was the most challenging moment you faced during the development of one of your games? Miyazaki revealed, I believe I haven't experienced too many very difficult moments because even when I have a lot of work and tight schedules, I genuinely enjoy developing games, so I'm generally content during the process. And when I finish developing a game, I often wonder, did I really go through hardship? Is it already over? But the moment that is more psychologically challenging is after the game starts to be sold, when there are some errors that end up affecting users. In the period between discovering the error and correcting it, that's when I feel the most emotional distress. For every new game Miyazaki creates, he always identifies and sets the main themes that will guide him in game direction. We witnessed this approach in our videos on the making of Demon Souls and Dark Souls. For Bloodborne, Miyazaki identified three main themes, and in this section, we will cover each of them. In an interview, the host asked, so, the concept of creating a challenging action RPG for gamers remains unchanged? Miyazaki explained, Yes, that aspect hasn't changed. From the very early stages of planning, the fundamental concept of this game was to create an authentic game for gamers. On top of that, the game has several themes at different layers, but I can mention three main ones. Exploration of the unknown, intense combat, and new online elements. First, there's the joy of exploring the unknown. This encompasses the enjoyment of exploring maps, as well as discovering a world and story filled with mystery and enigma. It also includes exploring new gameplay elements and expanding tactical options. Since this is a completely new title, we want to emphasize these aspects. Secondly, is the intensity of combat. This focus is particularly on battles, but includes both gameplay and presentation aspects. We want to depict battles as more gruesome and terrifying, so players can truly feel it. It's because of this that the satisfaction of overcoming a deadly struggle becomes more pronounced. The last theme is, of course, new online elements. We call it freely sharing exploration, which involves the sharing of chalice dungeons, as well as using a password to join someone's online game. We are fortunate that Miyazaki explained in detail the theme of exploration of the unknown, because it not only applies to Bloodborne, but to all the Souls games he has created. Miyazaki said, First, exploration of the unknown. While it does include the enjoyment of map exploration, it goes beyond that. It's used as a broader concept. This means that not only the map, but also the overall world and story, should be mysterious and filled with enigma, creating a space for players to explore. This concept also includes various gameplay elements. The tactical aspect of the active battle I mentioned earlier, as well as strategies, character builds, and other elements, are all part of it. We wanted to infuse the joy of exploring the unknown into these various gameplay elements. For example, in defining the weapons for this game, we have trick weapons that might help illustrate this. In the CG trailer shown at E3, you first see the saw cleaver, which is a weapon with a unique shape and a transformation mechanism that changes its properties when transformed. So, the gameplay involves figuring out how to use it effectively. Additionally, there are attacks while transforming the weapon, each with its unique properties. This means there's a considerable exploration space regarding mastering the use of this weapon, and that's the kind of exploration we wanted to offer players. Miyazaki shared that in Bloodborne, his aim was to move away from the passive combat style of his previous games and into something more proactive. He explained, yes, this relates to the second theme, intense combat. The battle system in Demon's Souls was primarily defined by swords and shields, 
especially shields, which had a somewhat passive image. However, for this game, we wanted to transition it into something more active, where players would proactively overcome situations. There are two aspects to it, presentation and gameplay. In terms of presentation, we want players to feel that enemies are terrifying and battles are intense. To achieve this, we focused on various elements such as visuals, interactions, and, in more obvious instances, blood splatters. So, in principle, the intensity of the battles, separate from the high difficulty, contributes to a sense of accomplishment. When you encounter an enemy, you should anticipate an intense battle, feel the tension during the fight. There are elements that contribute to this feeling beyond just numerical difficulty. The Souls games are known for their asynchronous online elements. With Bloodborne, Miyazaki introduced new features such as the usage of the beckoning bell to summon allies into one's world. Also, with the introduction of Chalice Dungeons, players can create their own and then share them with others. During an interview, the host was impressed by the ideas that Miyazaki comes up with in relation to online interactions, and he asked, I thought about it when we interviewed you for Demon's Souls, but are you the one coming up with these network-related concepts?" To which Miyazaki replied, Yes, that's right. Generally, I like to discuss and consult with trusted members of the team, and I receive a lot of ideas in that process. However, when it comes to network mechanisms, especially in the early stages, it tends to be more conceptual and abstract. So, I end up thinking about it on my own relatively often. It's a bit challenging to understand my explanations in this area in general. Before we delve into the section about Bloodborne's game design, let's continue tracing the progression of its timeline. If you recall, during the E3 2014 Bloodborne reveal, the Souls community only saw the CG trailer, and no official actual gameplay had been publicly released yet. Things changed on August 13, 2014, at Gamescom, when the fans received not just one, but two official Bloodborne videos. The first video is a gameplay trailer, the first to contain actual in-game footage. The second video is a demo gameplay, showing an early area when a player begins the game. Oh! <laughs> 
One of the key insights we gained from the video about the creation of Dark Souls is Miyazaki's perspective on the essence of video games. Fortunately, this perspective was revisited during an interview conducted while Bloodborne was in development. In the interview, the host posed the question, You've created Demon Souls, Dark Souls, 
and now Bloodborne. When you develop these games, what elements do you believe best support them? Additionally, can you share what aspects of the development process you personally find enjoyable? Miyazaki explained, This is something I say all the time, but it all comes down to a sense of achievement. I think the essence of games lies in attaching meaning and value to the actions you take. Demon Souls, Dark Souls, and Bloodborne all have one thing in common, and that's how it places that meaning and value on the sense of achievement you can earn from playing. That's how the battles and exploration elements work, and it applies to the world setting and story as well. You defeat powerful enemies, discover hidden locations and shortcuts, gain an understanding of the game's structure, and use the window you're given to imagine the game's world and story. My intention here is that every aspect of game design either creates or enhances the joy or the sense of achievement you feel as a result of these actions. That, and as for what I find fun about it, that's a difficult question. To be honest, I can't get enough of the game director role because it's kind of like being the total overall designer for a game. If I had to give one aspect in particular though, it'd be the map design. Outside of the Chalice Dungeons, I personally laid out all the maps in Bloodborne, something I like doing a lot, that connects to the sense of achievement I talked about too. Adding flow and meaning to the map structure helps provide a sort of joy to the player, the fun of drawing up a map of the land in your mind. That adds value to player actions. Along those lines, it's a really game-like design, I think. I really like that kind of thing. Among the core content that makes the Souls games very compelling to players are the boss fights. In an interview, the host asked, When you create a boss, what do you think about first, design or abilities? Miyazaki explained, Usually, design comes first. But when I have a more or less organized idea of how the boss will be, I ask the designer to create the artwork. Then I tell them what's needed, and what kind of boss it will be. I provide the minimum requirements the boss needs, and I leave the rest to the designer. Because I believe this adds even more to the originality. If I interfere too much, we end up thinking too much about the game's development logic. I let the designer imagine whatever comes to their mind. I think that way, something more unique comes out. The topic of difficulty always arises whenever a new Souls game is released. In an interview, the host inquired, When you have a reputation for creating challenging games, do you feel obliged to make your next game even more challenging than the previous one? How do you decide on the difficulty level? Miyazaki clarified, saying, What we are trying to create is a game whose difficulty level is manageable, not simply just challenging. That difficulty level, when it is manageable, leads to a real sense of accomplishment for the player. It's one of my biggest challenges. The host continued to inquire about how Miyazaki manages to balance the game to achieve the right level of difficulty. He asked, Making these changes must require a fine-tuning process, gaining a sense that a particular adjustment is the correct one. How do you decide which direction to adjust the game's balance? Do you rely on playtesting and player feedback for adjustments? Miyazaki elaborated, saying, That's a great question. For this game, I actively participated in the balancing process, particularly for the game's core feel and its fundamental elements. However, for more intricate aspects, especially those related to competitive multiplayer and post-ending replayability, I entrusted the balance team with the task. Nevertheless, I closely monitored our playtest sessions and gathered feedback. In particular, if the gameplay isn't enjoyable in any way, I believe that's a clear indicator that something needs adjustment, regardless of our intended concept or goals. I remember spending a significant amount of time in repeated playtest sessions, even involving SCE. However, it's important to note that we don't blindly accept all feedback. We focus on issues that cause players stress, disrupt the flow, or lead to boredom. When we receive such feedback, we listen attentively and explore potential solutions. However, it doesn't mean we implement suggested solutions verbatim. Once we identify areas that require improvement and devise a solution, we strive to find an approach that aligns with our concept and objectives, adhering to the game's overarching theme. Failing to do so would result in the game feeling like a disjointed patchwork. As early as our video on the making of Demon Souls, Miyazaki has emphasized the significance of players getting lost in his games. During an interview, the host raised an intriguing point. Zelda producer Eiji Aonuma thinks it's a sin to let players get lost in a game, and that has ultimately led to the series holding players' hands throughout. Conversely, 
the Souls games give players very little in the way of instruction or direction. You don't even implement a map in-game. Why? It's important to note that when this question was posed, The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild had not yet been released, and the changes Eiji Aonuma would introduce to the Zelda franchise were unknown. Miyazaki's reply to this question offers one of the best lessons for anyone aiming to learn his game design principles. He explained, Our goal was to allow players to do what they want, define their own goals, make their own discoveries, embrace their own values, and find their own interpretations. Core to that was the importance of getting lost. This gives value and meaning to finding one's way. Also, we're just not very nimble when it comes to giving good guidance, and rather than try to overcome our own shortcomings, we decided to focus on things that we were good at. This response offers a dual insight. It provides guidance on the nature of the Souls games and hints at the principle of design by subtraction, a concept attributed to Fumito Ueda, the creator of Ico, and a significant influence on Miyazaki's game design philosophy. If you recall, in our video about Dark Souls, Miyazaki mentioned that he engages in discussions about philosophical concepts with his team to provide them with additional context and inspiration for their work. The host revisited this topic and inquired, In the early stages of Dark Souls development, your discussions delved into topics such as the origins of the world, the meaning of life, and the significance of fire. Did you have similar discussions when planning Bloodborne? Miyazaki responded, saying, Well, I can't reveal many of them due to potential spoilers. However, we did explore themes like what lies deep within a beast, and what does it mean to become one? As always, I had passionate discussions with the designers on a wide range of topics. In the beginning of the game Bloodborne, players wake up in a clinic and discover a letter instructing them to seek Pale Blood, with no clear context provided about what or who Pale Blood is. The host commented on this, stating, One distinctive aspect of your games is that the truths behind them are rarely revealed within the game itself. Miyazaki responded, saying, Well, it's not necessarily my explicit goal, but I do aim to leave room for players' imaginations. The host continued, Indeed, there's enough space for players to let their imaginations run wild. In this game, the protagonist is motivated to embark on a journey after finding a hastily written note instructing them to seek pale blood to transcend the hunt. However, the term pale blood is scarcely mentioned thereafter. In Miyazaki's response, one can discern the meticulous attention he devotes to elements like this, even though it may seem that the letter is merely a device to kickstart the player's adventure. It evokes memories of instances like ceaseless discharge, where a wealth of lore exists, yet players have no direct means of accessing and learning about it, exemplifying Miyazaki's principle of hidden beauty. Miyazaki explained further, You're right, I did contemplate making it a bit easier to grasp, but we ultimately decided to leave it as is. I believe there are two distinct ways to interpret pale blood in this context. One refers to the color of the sky after defeating the vacuous spider and unveiling the Mensis secret ritual. The sky appears as an extremely pale blue, reminiscent of a body drained of blood. There's also a message placed in Yahargul Unseen Village that alludes to this. This message is encountered before the ritual is revealed, so when players are kidnapped and brought to Yahargul, they don't yet understand its significance. However, after the ritual is unveiled, players may revisit the message and have an aha moment. That was my intention at least, although I must admit that it might be a bit challenging to pick up on. Regardless, this interpretation leads to the idea that seek pale blood involves uncovering and thwarting that ritual. One of the key characteristics that sets Bloodborne apart from other Souls games, and even subsequent titles like Sekiro or Elden Ring, is its incredibly visceral nature. A significant contributor to this is the use of blood splatters. During an interview, the host inquired, I'd like to shift the focus slightly and discuss the presentation in Bloodborne. I find the portrayal in Bloodborne quite intense, even among Japanese games. When it comes to such depictions, were there specific boundaries established during the planning stage? Was even the portrayal of blood, for instance, a deliberate consideration during development? Miyazaki explained, in a similar vein, we dedicated considerable effort to portraying blood in Bloodborne. The depiction of blood was undeniably crucial in conveying the game's world and the sensation of deadly combat in battles. However, we aimed to avoid eliciting strong feelings of physiological disgust. Thus, when it comes to blood splatter effects, 
we chose a more symbolic and almost painterly style over a realistic one. The blood's color is not a vibrant, eye-catching red, but rather a muted, subdued hue. This choice better aligns with the visual style I envisioned. As a side note, especially for characters with intense blood splatters, we adjusted the blood's color to be closer to gray, giving rise to the term ashen blood disease. Whether these decisions achieve their intended effect is a multifaceted question, but in any case, we were attentive to these aspects while crafting the game. Earlier, we discussed how Miyazaki highly values the idea of players getting lost in a Souls game, not only in the exploration of the game's world, but also in its inherent nature. During an interview, the host inquired, So, in the world of Bloodborne, there's the Hunter's Dream and several areas referred to as Nightmares. There's also a world that functions as the game's reality, correct? Miyazaki responded, Ah, you're asking if places like Yarnum are meant to represent reality? Well, that carries some implications within the game's narrative. Yarnum, especially at night with the presence of hunters, undeniably resembles a nightmarish world. But is it genuinely a nightmare? Or perhaps it was at some point. These are the kinds of questions. I believe different gamers will form their own interpretations of this, especially based on the ending they reach. This intentional ambiguity is part of our design. It might veer off topic a bit, but I genuinely enjoy reading how gamers interpret and contemplate the story and world of my games. I don't want to deprive them of the space for open interpretation. That, in fact, is one of the pleasures I derive after completing development. Nonetheless, it's often a delicate balance, and I can't claim to be an expert in this regard, so I can't be entirely confident about how it will be received. My apologies in advance if it doesn't align with expectations. The Souls games are known for their strong emphasis on consequences and accountability for player actions. For instance, in Dark Souls, the curse mechanic can permanently impact gameplay, placing a significant burden on the player and necessitating action for its removal. This approach highlights the consequences of a player's choices and the accountability required to rectify them. Ultimately, players accept these challenges as part of the journey, rather than viewing their efforts as a waste of time. However, in Bloodborne, discovering that the entire playthrough is essentially a dream might leave a different impression. In an interview, the host raised the question, creating a narrative where you operate within dreams offers a great deal of creative freedom. You can explore concepts that wouldn't be feasible in reality, but if you take that too far, it could become too chaotic and players might not find it enjoyable. How do you strike a balance between reality and dreams? Miyazaki elaborated saying, I think you're absolutely correct. It wouldn't be enjoyable if you could simply do anything you pleased in dreams. In this game, Yarnum's setting is fundamentally grounded in reality. While it's so dark and grim that it could be interpreted as an actual nightmare in the end, it's not a dream world where any imaginable thing can come to life. Bloodborne encompasses elements of both Gothic and Cthulhu-style horror, but it's the former that is established from the outset and serves as a visual reference for the game's atmosphere. This is because Gothic horror is more rooted in the realm of reality. However, that doesn't imply that it's actual reality. It's a world steeped in grotesque, terrifying horror. Within this world, you have a gradual erosion by Cthulhu-style horror. That's the concept at play here. The Souls games have garnered a passionate and dedicated fanbase. During an interview, the host inquired, Since their release, Demon's Souls and Dark Souls have gained immense stature and are now considered among the all-time greats. How do you handle having such an obsessive and passionate fanbase? Miyazaki explained, First and foremost, I am incredibly delighted to have such fans. While I cannot deny feeling some pressure to meet their expectations, I derive great joy from reading and listening to their thoughts. The fact that these individuals invest so much time in my games and engage in passionate discussions about something I've created, I go online and enjoy reading their comments. Naturally, there are moments when I encounter less enjoyable feedback, but on the whole, I find great pleasure in their remarks. As a creator, it's such a valuable resource to listen to their honest feedback and think about what game I'm going to make next. You couldn't pay people to invest the kind of time and dedication that these fans willingly contribute. The host followed up, asking, Does it bother you that people tend to focus on your game's perceived high level of difficulty rather than other aspects of the experience? Miyazaki replied, It's not something that frustrates me. 
I understand why people inquire about it frequently, but I'm content that people find it fascinating. In that sense, I don't mind addressing questions about difficulty repeatedly. I find it enjoyable to discuss. As a game creator, or a creator of anything for that matter, the fact that people are captivated, inquisitive, and curious about what I'm crafting is a privilege that should not be taken for granted. I am deeply grateful for it. During our video on Dark Souls, we learned that Miyazaki kept a computer screen continuously displaying player feedback, both positive and negative. In one of the interviews about Bloodborne, the host inquired, You mentioned user reviews during our conversation. Do you personally read them quite often? Miyazaki responded with a chuckle, saying, Yes, I do. Mostly when I'm in a stable mental state. The host followed up, asking, Do you avoid reading them when your mental state is unstable? To this, Miyazaki replied, Well, yes, that's correct. It's not that I don't want to read them, but I feel that if I read them when I'm in a bad state, the outcomes might skew more toward the negative side. So, I tend to refrain in those situations. The host continued with another question. I see. Is there a practice of incorporating user opinions expressed in reviews and such into game development? Miyazaki explained, Yes, indeed. It's not a matter of blindly accepting them, but we certainly take them into consideration. As a game developer, I believe that reviews from both the media and users are immensely valuable. They engage with our games passionately and provide reviews that are profoundly enthusiastic, detailed, and comprehensive, based on their experiences. Such reviews, which can be challenging for a creator to come by, hold significant statistical significance. It would be a missed opportunity not to regard them as a source of inspiration. Moreover, they genuinely bring us joy. The concept of Kaizen, which refers to continuous improvement, is highly valued in Japanese culture. In an interview, the host asked, As you worked on Demon Souls and Dark Souls, were there any ideas you had for the game but couldn't realize at the time? Were you able to implement any of those ideas in Bloodborne based on your past experiences? Miyazaki explained, There were numerous ideas, both significant and minor. To provide a few more accessible examples, I could mention how armor parameters are now percentage-based, or how item effects are based on granting stat bonuses. One issue we encountered with Demon's Souls was that as players reached higher levels, the concept of armor began to lose its significance to some extent. In this game, armor parameters were based on static values that couldn't be enhanced. As players grew stronger, the percentage of their overall defense provided by armor decreased. The importance of armor equipment gradually diminished as players progressed, and eventually, at a high enough level, armor became little more than decorative. In an effort to address this, we introduced an armor upgrade system in Dark Souls. We allowed players to enhance their armor stats, ensuring that as their characters grew stronger, the percentage of defense attributed to armor wouldn't decrease, and that armor would remain significant. While this had some effect, we encountered issues with the formula used, and fine-tuning it proved extremely challenging. We had limited resources available for balancing, so it became a bit problematic. Taking these experiences into account, we designed Bloodborne's armor to rely on percentage reductions. As players progress, the percentage of their character's overall defense attributed to armor doesn't decrease, ensuring armor remains an essential aspect of the game. This approach was also easier for us to fine-tune. A similar principle applies to items in your inventory. For example, items like Molotov cocktails had a static attack value, which was useful early in the game, but became less effective in the late game. We wanted to address this issue. A simple example is throwing knives. Items contribute to the role-playing experience. So we believed it would be more enjoyable if players had the flexibility to create characters that relied on specific items, such as a character specializing in throwing knives for offense. In Bloodborne, we categorized recovery items separately, making it easier for players to express their character's personality through the items they use. It may not be a flashy change, but it's one element we hope will enhance the overall experience. Miyazaki has maintained a humble and low-profile persona, despite being considered one of the most influential game creators. In an interview, the host asked, Is there a particular aspect of the game that you take the most pride in? And what do you believe is the most significant gameplay improvement compared to Dark Souls? Miyazaki responded, What aspect am I proud of? Well, personality-wise, I like to avoid putting my pride on parade. Also, I really don't think this game should be compared to Dark Souls. With all that in mind, though, one of this game's major selling points is definitely the combat. 
It incorporates the use of trick weapons and firearms, combined with dodging and a regain system. The result is an exhilarating combat experience filled with a constant sense of life or death. This system underwent extensive refinement in collaboration with SCE, and I sincerely hope players will appreciate what we've crafted. Finally, the host asked a question that many fans have been curious about. Among all the games you've developed, which one is your favorite? Miyazaki responded with a smile, saying, That's a very challenging question, and comparing them is like having three or four children, and someone asking, which one is the most beautiful? I'm going to answer that they're all my favorites. But if I were to choose one that holds a special place in my heart, it's Bloodborne. It's the one that left the most significant impression on me. I believe I made it in my own way, the way I wanted to. It's worth noting that at the time this question was asked, all of the Souls games had been released, except for Elden Ring. In other words, Bloodborne surpassed both Sekiro and Dark Souls 3 as Miyazaki's favorite. The Souls games stand out as a select few where skilled players can showcase their gaming prowess to their fans, taking on challenges such as no leveling or no hit runs. In an interview, Miyazaki shared his thoughts on these challenges. He said, Indeed, I am left in awe. Challenges that we could have never conceived of have gloriously surfaced, accompanied by equally glorious skill and determination in conquering them. Such feats are truly exciting. I must admit that our side of things doesn't contribute much to setting up these challenges and presenting them to the world. Most of these stunts are conceived by the players themselves, and that's precisely why they hold such significance. All we really want to do is lay the foundation by creating a game filled with the potential for such accomplishments. If we construct a world filled with formidable obstacles, I am confident that players will devise various fascinating methods to overcome them. It's a form of collaboration, one that I find immensely enjoyable. When questioned about his own skill as a player of the Souls games, Miyazaki revealed, I think I'd better pass on giving a straight answer. To say that I'm not the greatest at games would be an understatement, so I'd rather not disappoint you all. But even so, rest assured in the fact that I can beat this title, albeit with a lot of teeth gritting. The same goes for both Demon's Souls and Dark Souls. In recent years, crowdfunding games have emerged as a popular way to bring gaming projects to life. Notable examples of this trend include games like Hollow Knight and Grim Dawn. During an interview, the host shifted the conversation away from Bloodborne and asked, I'd like to discuss something unrelated for a moment. In a previous interview, you expressed an interest in smaller scale game development, akin to indie games. We've noticed a surge in indie games seeking funding through crowdfunding in recent years. What are your thoughts on this growing enthusiasm for indie games, which is somewhat unprecedented from a developer's perspective? Miyazaki responded, I believe it's a positive development. It might sound peculiar, but ultimately, starting a game development project requires some form of capital, doesn't it? Having a wide array of methods to secure this capital is, in my opinion, a highly beneficial thing. Conveying and gaining support for the idea that the game we're aiming to create holds value in order to secure capital can be quite challenging. Therefore, when the avenues for securing capital are limited, the effectiveness of presentations within those constraints becomes restricted as well. Consequently, the range of games that actually see the light of day also becomes limited. If that were the case, it would be monotonous and stifling. So, as a gaming enthusiast, I'm thrilled to witness the emergence of indie games and crowdfunding as new opportunities. Looking at it from a different perspective, it might even offer a glimmer of hope for me if I were ever to find myself unemployed from my current position. I still aspire to create games for a long time, and if there's a chance, even a slim one, I'd seize it. I do recognize that it's not as straightforward as it may seem, though. To conclude our discussion on game design, Miyazaki addressed a question regarding future game creators. The host asked, Just one more thing. Could you please share a message with those who aspire to become game developers in the future? Miyazaki responded, That's a straightforward one. It's genuinely a lot of fun. I don't think the game industry is an easy path, and perhaps I'm being somewhat irresponsible since I can't take any responsibility. But if you have the passion, I genuinely encourage you to pursue game development, whether as a fellow game creator or as a gamer. I have two pieces of advice. First, I believe that games, as a form of media content, offer numerous possibilities. This is due to two factors. Firstly, games constantly incorporate cutting-edge technologies, 
So as technology advances, it is reflected in games. Secondly, it's about the element of time. I think people have increasingly more leisure time, and how they choose to spend that time is crucial. I believe games enhance the quality of that time and bring joy to life. Another piece of advice I have is that I played many video games before I began developing them. What I can say is that developing games is akin to playing a game, and it's an immensely enjoyable process. Therefore, I believe that those who genuinely relish playing games and wish to invest in them won't regret their decision or feel sorrowful because they'll always be engaged in play. In summary, game development is a realm brimming with possibilities, and it's an absolute blast. So, best of luck, and pour your heart into it. In our previous video, we discussed the Berserk references you can discover within Bloodborne. However, in this section, we will delve into the inspirations that played a significant role in shaping Miyazaki's creative vision for the game. The first noticeable aspect of Bloodborne is its departure from the typical Souls game world. The host inquired, By the way, it seems that in this game, the world doesn't adhere to the traditional swords and magic setting. It leans more toward a modern or contemporary world, doesn't it? Miyazaki clarified, Yes, in terms of the time period, we drew inspiration from the Victorian era. However, when people think of the Victorian era, they often associate it with cities like London. But in this game, the setting is not in the heart of that Victorian era. Instead, it's on the outskirts, in a somber and antiquated city. It's a historical world imbued with the aesthetics of Gothic architecture, gas lamps, and motifs from the Victorian era. Regarding the setting and location of the game, the host inquired, Earlier you mentioned London as an example, but do you have a specific country in mind as the setting's inspiration? Miyazaki responded, We somewhat imagine Eastern Europe, but it's not a direct representation of any particular place. The game won't explicitly state it. In any case, Yarnum is a remote borderland, far from the central hub, a place steeped in ancient history, darkness, prejudice, and secrets. The interviewer then asked, Did you conduct any location scouting or research trips to Eastern Europe? Miyazaki replied, We didn't conduct on-site location shoots, but I did visit the Czech Republic and Romania for research purposes. It was a whirlwind tour, albeit a hectic one, but it provided us with a great deal of inspiration. While not a direct replication, those experiences certainly influenced the unique atmosphere and ambiance of the game. The host continued saying, From the visuals and other elements it appears to exude a strong gothic horror ambiance. Miyazaki affirmed, Indeed, that's correct. I hope players can sense that atmosphere which draws inspiration from Bram Stoker's Dracula. The city is an ancient medical town situated in the outskirts, yet it's afflicted by a rampant disease known as the Beastly Plague. Bram Stoker's Dracula was one of my influential reading experiences from childhood. One of the most intriguing aspects of Bloodborne is its gradual shift from gothic horror, encompassing werewolves and vampires, into Lovecraftian horror, involving extraterrestrial beings and cosmic monstrosities. During an interview, the host inquired, What served as your inspirations when you first conceived Bloodborne? Miyazaki responded, I drew considerable inspiration from H.P. Lovecraft's book, The Call of Cthulhu. Those who have played Bloodborne are likely aware of the strong influence Lovecraft had on me and the game. Other significant influences on me included the concept of cosmic horror and the film Brotherhood of the Wolf. Although Miyazaki mentioned it briefly, the movie Brotherhood of the Wolf had a significant influence on the game, from its thematic elements to the costumes of the main characters. The film revolves around the investigation and pursuit of a mysterious creature that brutally attacks the villagers. The main characters are tasked with uncovering the truth behind the mystery and defeating the beast. If you watch the film, you'll notice some intriguing parallels with the plot of Bloodborne. Before we conclude the discussion on inspiration, let's address the final question about why Miyazaki chose this particular time period as the basis for the game. The host asked, the game is set in the 19th century Victorian era. Could you explain the reasoning behind selecting this specific historical period? Miyazaki elaborated, saying, We opted for this historical setting because it aligned with the gameplay concept we had in mind. In the case of Demon Souls, the gameplay revolved around swords and shields, resulting in somewhat passive battles. For this game, we aim to create a more dynamic combat system, and that's where the idea of firearms came into play. 
However, we didn't want to transform it into a typical shooter game. So, we found the Victorian era, with its lingering association with old-style firearms, to be the ideal backdrop for our world. Moreover, during the Victorian era, the prevalence of metal armor was reduced, and cloth-based equipment was more common. This suited our vision of fast-paced, active combat, and the brutal, blood-soaked conflicts we wanted to depict. Another intention was to fully leverage the capabilities of the PS4. The Victorian era meshed well with the world we sought to create. Yarnum, the city in which the game unfolds, fuses the Gothic architecture of an ancient city with Victorian influences. The intricate details and layered expressions of Gothic and Victorian styles were territories we hadn't fully explored before. It's been an enjoyable journey, both in terms of design and graphics. In our video about the development of Dark Souls 2, we discussed how Katakawa acquired a majority stake in From Software, making it one of its subsidiaries. This led to significant changes within From Software, most notably the appointment of Miyazaki as the company president. This transition occurred while Miyazaki was already working as the director of Bloodborne, effectively splitting his time between directorial duties and his role as company president. To gain insight into how he managed to balance these responsibilities and successfully deliver one of his greatest works, let's explore some of the best questions posed to Miyazaki. This will provide a glimpse into his perspective and highlight his unwavering passion and dedication to the art of game design and creation. The first question posed was, you became the president of From Software. Has your involvement with this game changed in any way? Miyazaki clarified, it hasn't changed. I have no intention of stepping away from the development front, and I took on the role of president with the understanding that I would continue to be a director. If someone were to ask me which role I would be more inclined to slack off on, it would be the role of president. I initially changed careers because I wanted to create games, and the actual process of game development and game direction is incredibly enjoyable for me. If someone were to tell me, stop directing games, I would genuinely contemplate my future. I would even leave the company if it meant I couldn't continue directing games. The second question inquired, would you say that taking on the role of president has reduced the amount of time you're directly involved in game design? Many would assume that's the case. How is your time divided now between your duties as company president and your game development responsibilities? Miyazaki responded, To be honest, I'm probably neglecting a significant portion of my presidential duties. Or you could say that everyone around me is accommodating me in that regard. In terms of percentages, I'd estimate it's around 20%. Out of a typical five-day work week, I'd need to dedicate a little over a day to those responsibilities. Nonetheless, it's worth noting that even before, I couldn't allocate 100% of my time to directing. Knowing that we'd established the current company structure, I had the director-level staff devise a new production workflow that helps support my work when I'm pressed for time, so I wouldn't say I'm devoting less time to game design now. The third question raised was, as Shigeru Miyamoto rose through the ranks at Nintendo, he became more business-focused. Are you concerned about a similar shift happening to you? Miyazaki replied, I hold the role of a director who happens to be the president, not the other way around. Fortunately, those around me understand my stance on this matter. Furthermore, from software's core strength lies in crafting distinctive products with unique perspectives. It's a singular position to be in, and thankfully, I haven't had to compromise my time for directing. There's no guarantee that this will always be the case, but in reality, there are no guarantees in any role, whether as a president or not. The fourth question inquired, how do you manage the dual roles of company president and director? Miyazaki elaborated, it may sound unusual, but it felt quite natural. Being the president entails dealing with serious matters, less about anticipation, and more about handling substantial responsibilities. Fortunately, I had incredibly talented individuals working on the development side this time. There were aspects I could entrust to them. We established a system where I could focus on specific areas and have confidence in their abilities for others. I believe they performed admirably. Working concurrently as both president and director is how I envision things moving forward. I don't mean to suggest that I'm no longer deeply involved, rather, the process has evolved. This change wasn't detrimental, it was, in fact, invigorating. It's not merely about being the president and director, I feel there's nothing I can't tackle. Now they need to assist me in my role as company president. The fifth question was, 
What opportunities has your role as president of From Software afforded you that you might not have had otherwise? Miyazaki clarified, A very recent and clear example is the choice to define Dark Souls 3 as a significant milestone, enabling us to move forward and take on a wholly new project. This decision aligns with our mission to craft distinct games with a unique viewpoint and not only represents my own aspirations, but also those of the entire game development team. If I had not held both the roles of president and director, this might not have been feasible. Now that Miyazaki is the company president, he was able to get his own room in the office. The final question asked, We still have lots of wonderful memories from our last visit here. The only regret was that we weren't able to check out Fromm's legendary president's office. What's inside there, anyway? Miyazaki humorously replied, Legendary president's office? What's that? I've never heard of it. If you're talking about the office Jin had, I'm afraid that's already been packed up. That, and I'd better not talk about what that office used to look like anyway. I wouldn't want anyone to get mad at me after all. As for my own office, well, that's not something I can really show to other people. It's just a huge mess. There are all kinds of games, videos, board games, manga, reference books, figures, and so forth all over the place. It's crazy. Even if I told you, go ahead, check it out. I think Mr. Kakura over in the PR department would probably put a stop to it. The Souls games share a significant history with the Tokyo Game Shows. It all began with the ill-fated demo event at TGS 2008, featuring Demon Souls, and continued with the lavish marketing campaigns Bandai Namco organized for Dark Souls 2 during TGS 2013. On the first day of TGS 2014, the Souls community received not only a new Bloodborne trailer, but also an eagerly anticipated release date, February 6, 2015. If you recall our Demon Souls videos, you'll remember that the 2008 demo was a disaster. Back then, the gaming world was still unfamiliar with the concept of a Souls game, and players found the gameplay to be clunky and tedious. Now, in 2014, players were willingly queuing for hours just to get their hands on the latest Souls game. A Japanese fan shared his experience trying out Bloodborne at TGS 2014, saying, the excitement and anticipation for this game were definitely in the air at the Tokyo Game Show. I joined the line only 10 minutes after the doors opened on September 18th, the first day of TGS, and the wait time was already an hour. While playable demos of the game had been available at Gamescom in Germany, this was the first chance for Japanese gamers to try it out. Even on the business day when general visitors were absent, long queues persisted. In this Tokyo Game Show version, there were more character options from the start, and we discovered two new types of trick weapons. Attendees at the event received a badge for trying the game, and the first 100 people who successfully completed the trial version on the public opening day received an exclusive t-shirt. It's worth noting that completing the demo was no walk in the park. Despite it being a trial version, the enemies were relentless and showed no mercy. Furthermore, if you perished, you had to start over, and during my attempt, I was only allotted 15 minutes of playtime. While it was possible to bypass enemies and head straight for the boss, doing so meant missing out on valuable items, 
making it a challenging decision. The Bloodborne booth proudly featured the Cleric Beast. If you could vanquish this formidable foe, you'd conquer the demo. I managed to reach the boss during my initial playthrough but was defeated once. However, I persevered and emerged victorious on my second try. So, if you possess the skill, that Bloodborne t-shirt could be yours as well. On September 21st, the final day of TGS 2014, details about the online alpha test for Bloodborne were revealed. The registration for testers was set to run from September 24th to September 28th, and it was open exclusively to PS Plus members who owned a PS4. On the same day that the alpha test was announced, an event called the UO Battle Event was held at TGS. Highly skilled players from various titles on the PlayStation platform appeared at the event to showcase their talents and promote the games. The final segment of the event was dedicated to Bloodborne, with producer Masaki Yamagiwa taking on the challenge of completing the same level available at the demo stations. Notably, game director Hidetaka Miyazaki was absent from these promotional events. Instead, there was a constant presence of another Sony employee named Yasuhiro Kitao, who was responsible for the promotion of Bloodborne. Kitao would later join From Software and become a valuable member of Miyazaki's team, attending ceremonies and award events with him. Returning to the UO Battle event, despite the formidable challenge of clearing the demo level, within 20 minutes, Yamagiwa successfully achieved this feat. The audience responded with enthusiastic applause, solidifying his reputation as a producer. For context, in a previous event held in the United States, out of 3,500 participants, only about 20 managed to clear the same level that Yamagiwa completed. In contrast, during the Tokyo Game Show, which spanned four days and had approximately 1,250 participants attempting the challenge, around 40 people were able to clear it. More than a month after TGS 2014, on November 12th, Sony made an announcement regarding a change in the game's release date. Originally slated for February 5, 2015, the new release date was pushed back to March 24, 2015. In an article posted on the PlayStation blog, Masaki Yamagiwa addressed the community, expressing, Dear community, it is with regret that I must inform you that Bloodborne will be slightly delayed. While development continues unabated, we would like our team to deliver the best possible final experience. We were gratified by the feedback and data we received from those who participated in our limited alpha test. The extra production time will also allow us to better integrate these learnings. Bloodborne is now set to launch in North America exclusively on PS4 on March 24, 2015. Please look forward to some exciting Bloodborne news in early December. Thank you very much for your continued support. In a separate interview, we had the opportunity to gain insight from Miyazaki. The host posed a question, I'd like to shift the topic slightly. Bloodborne had its release date changed from February 5th, 2015 to March 24th, 2015. When it comes to releasing a game, there's an initial release date set, and then deadlines are determined working backward from that point. Could you please share your thoughts on striking a balance between deadlines and quality? It seems like a straightforward idea that more time leads to higher work quality, but the reality may be more complex. Miyazaki responded, Hmm. The topic of the release date caused a lot of trouble for various people. All I can say is that I'm truly sorry. I feel a deep sense of regret about it. There's nothing else to say, except an apology. The host followed up with another question, regarding whether to prioritize improving quality, even if it means extending deadlines or strictly adhering to deadlines. What are your thoughts on that? Miyazaki explained, In general, I don't believe there's a one-size-fits-all answer to that. Both our team and SCE are not creating games as mere hobbies for the wealthy. While we have the pure ideal of crafting something exceptional, it's also a business, a very real one. I think, and this includes self-reflection, that we should not take it lightly. Above all, it's essential to preserve the environment and circumstances that enable us to continue creating the games we aspire to make. However, it's not a matter of absolute devotion to deadlines either. While we acknowledge the significance of deadlines, there are times when we simply cannot compromise to deliver a game that will captivate players. In the case of Bloodborne, I'm deeply appreciative of SCE for comprehending and accepting our request to extend the deadline once. It was not an easy decision to make. From a slightly different perspective, I believe deadlines are imperative in the creative process. For instance, having a deadline compels you to refine and optimize ideas, 
which is a crucial step in producing a great game. I'm naturally inclined to procrastination, so I embrace the saying, necessity is the mother of invention. As hinted at in Yamagiwa's letter to the community, there were indeed exciting Bloodborne updates in the first week of December. The first of these was a new video showcased at the 2014 Game Awards. This video featured exclusive Bloodborne gameplay footage showcasing online cooperative play. Let there be no doubt. If it moves, you can be sure it's a beast. And even if it doesn't, well, don't take any chances. <laughs> all over the shop. You'll be one of them. Sooner or later. <laughs> Just a day after the Game Awards, an even more significant surprise awaited the Souls community when Bloodborne was featured at the PlayStation Experience. What made this event truly memorable and special for all Souls fans is that it is the only video of Miyazaki available online, aside from events where he receives awards. Miyazaki did not appear in any of the official From Software approved videos detailing the making of Dark Souls, Bloodborne, or Sekiro. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from From Software, Hidetaka Miyazaki. えっと、ブラッドボーンのディレクターフロムソフトの宮崎です。本日はブラッドボーンの新しい要素、聖杯ダンジョンについてご紹介します。Hi, I'm Hidetaka Miyazaki of From Software. Today I like to show everyone a brand new uh, feature from Bloodborne called the Chalice Dungeon. 聖杯ダンジョンはブラッドボーンの 10以上あるマップの1つ、ヤーナムの地下に幾層にもわたって広がる地下遺跡のことです。
So as you all probably know, Bloodborne takes place in an old, eerie town called Yarnum. Uh, Yarnum is consisted of uh, about 10 areas, one of which is a multi-layered underground ruins. いわゆるローグライクゲームの生成ダンジョンを思い浮かべてもらえると近しいかもしれません。この地下遺跡は、まあ、それにまみえる人によってその姿を変えるという特性があります。So the dungeon is very much like a roguelike uh, game in the way that they are created. Uh, it changes its appearance depending on you know, the player and the hunter. And so uh, let's take a look at it. So talking about it isn't as exciting as looking at it live. So we're going to take you through the dungeon today. なお、本日の実機プレイはすでにマッチング済みマルチプレイが始まっている状態ですですから黒いダンジョンの画面でもう一人のプレイヤー白いハンターも確認できると思います。So today for this demo we've already、uh, set it up so that it's multiplayer but pay close attention to the black hunter、uh, on the left but then also you can already see that we've been joined by the white hunter as well. それでは、えー、と実機プレイを開始しましょうダンジョン探索を始めましょう聖杯ダンジョン第一の狙いをご説明します第一の狙いは攻略の新鮮さですこれは、まあ、ごくシンプルな話で、まあ、定期配置であったりダンジョン構造であったりそういったものが変化することで攻略を新鮮なものにするそしてその新鮮な攻略を継続的に提供するそういったことを狙ったものです So the first aim or objective that we have with the, du with the dungeon is that I just said that、um, it's going to change its form depending on the player. So、uh, when, once you walk in, they're、uh, procedurally generated and it's going to be ever changing. そうしているうちに結構やらしいトラップに引っかかってしまいました。And of course, classic, but you know, we fell into a trap here. 巨石のトラップから逃げた先には落とし穴が仕掛けられています。そして落とし穴から落ちた先には暗い下水、その先には油ぎった広い沼が広がっています。So now that we've fallen into this pitfall, we're gonna、uh, follow this path of the water, and now that we've arrived in a swamp-like area. このように聖杯ダンジョンでは上下三層基本とした立体構造、そして豊富なシチュエーション、そしてそれらを生かした攻略とトラップによりゲームプレイを無味乾燥。つまらないものにしないための工夫がされています。So the dungeon is actually、uh, three layers in obviously a 3D map.、Uh, it offers a very intricate layout in that sense that it offers variety, keep things interesting, lots of surprises and tricks and traps. さて、そうしているうちに次の強敵キャラクター、あの沼の巨人に出会ってしまいました。Uh, yes, we see an enemy right in front of us.、Uh, looks quite uh, difficult uh, with a very sharp weapon. この沼の巨人は、赤熱した武器と油切った沼という組み合わせが凶悪な難敵なんですけれども、衝撃力の高い、重い武器が有効であるという側面があるので、今回はそうした武器を持っている白いハンター、えっと、山際プロデューサーのキャラクターに活躍してもらいましょう。So his weapon is already red hot,、um, and then combined with a tar-like substance, it just only increases in power. However, his weakness is、uh, anything sort of attacks by、uh, heavy hitting weapons. So we had the white hunter who was carrying a hammer, which was、uh, which proved to be very very effective. <laughs> なんとか難敵を倒したようなので、次はえっとこのダンジョンの各所を閉ざす仕掛けを解錠しに行きます。So now that we've gotten rid of him, I'm going to show you、um, some tricks that we have also laying around in the dungeon. そしてその仕掛けを解除した後には、それによって解放されたボスルームに向かうことになります。So another thing in the dungeon is that you're going to want to look for these activation points、uh, coming up the staircase here. 実は今回のボスルームは、この実機プレイの最初の場所。えー、と青いライティングの広い通路ですね、その先にあったわけですが、今回はそこに戻るために、今来た道を引き返すようなことはせず、複雑で入り組んだ立体構造を生かしたショートカットを発見して、それで戻るようにします
So we successfully unlocked that, uh, that activation point, as you just saw, and we're on our way to our boss area. Um, but this area was actually at the far end of the main route that you saw when we started the demo. But instead of going back the path that we came along, we're going to take the shortcut that opened up for us. So, so we're going to dungeon play the boss of the dungeon play. So here we have the reveal of the boss, which is a, a flame-clad uh, old ancient guard dog. かなり強い敵なんですが、とりあえず2人には頑張ってもらうとして、私の方では聖杯ダンジョンの第2の狙いについて簡単にお話ししておこうと思います。so while uh, these two hopefully don't die and succeed in defeating this boss, I'd like to tell you about another uh, sort of aim that we have be uh, behind this dungeon. The dungeon dungeon.第2の狙いは第1の狙いでいった新鮮な攻略。これを共有することそれも自由なやり方で共有することです。So as I said uh, earlier, this dungeon because it's uh, procedurally generated, it's going to keep everyone, uh, everything very fresh and interesting, offering lots of varieties of strategies and sort of tactics depending on the player. And so the second aim for that is taking that and actually giving the player the freedom to share that. And it's up to you to decide who you want to share that with. So just to recap, the Chalice Dungeon, uh, two things. One is to keep it really fresh, really fresh, uh, interesting, uh, an ever-changing dungeon. And the second thing is that you're going to be able to share it with your friends, community. Uh, it's really up to you. あの、プレゼンテーション番長はまあ、プレイヤー用にかなり無類調整になっているので、まあ、そのままではあの、このまま勝ってしまうとかなり強さめだと思います。だから、まあ、いつも通りこのボスを倒す達成感というのは、まあ
what I might be able to do for you, and I, I hope it's uh, interesting for you, is to do a little bit of a behind-the-scenes uh, uh, discussion to let you know how this, this project wound up coming to be. And I'll let you know about you know, the team that was assembled to realize uh, Hidetaka Miyazaki's vision for the score. So ultimately, this was a team of six composers writing 130 minutes of music, spanned three continents, uh, was two and a half years in the making, and involved collaborations between five separate Sony campuses. Uh, I just thought those were impressive statistics because, you know, it's, it, this became a big production, but it didn't start out that way. So initially, this project started out uh, as uh, discussions between From Software and the Japan studio. And at this point, our colleagues in Japan sat down with Miyazaki-san and the From Software staff composers to discuss their thoughts about the score. So this is my uh, colleague in uh, Japan. I'm very fond of him. This is Kei, and he's the audio director for Japan Studio. So he initially sat down with the folks from From Software and Miyazaki and asked if they had any goals for the score. So unfortunately, Kei couldn't be here. Uh, he had to take a flight back to Japan. But he had this to say. Since From Software had their own in-house composers, naturally we could have just used them. But since this was a new challenge for us, with a new game for the new PS4 hardware, their composers thought that they needed something new and different to work with, especially when it came to music that would match the game's atmosphere and the type of musical expressions they wanted to aim for and a quality that could be accepted worldwide, which was an important point. So Kei continues, he says, Miyazaki-san gathered some video material to give us an idea of what the kind of music he wanted and the music that uh, he, he brought to them was from this album. Uh, this is uh, City of, uh, of the Fallen. And this was composed by an American composer that you might know, Ryan Ammon. And uh, Ryan had uh, done the music for the Sony film Elysium, of which he collaborated with, with Penka on that. So when Miyazaki-san had presented this material to uh, Kei and our folks, our, our colleagues in Japan, uh, they reached out to the director of our music studio here in America, and that's Chuck Dowd. And they were wondering if we could get in touch with, with Ryan. Now, it's funny how things work out, because as, as luck would have it, Ryan, uh, we were in L.A. at the time. It was myself and Chuck, and Ryan happened to be in L.A. as well and literally just swung by our Sony campus in Los Angeles, and we started to talk and discuss the project. And uh, Ryan was fantastic. He's a brilliant composer, and he was really excited uh, to get involved in the project. So initially, our task was to create uh, the music for a trailer that was going to be the debut trailer for Bloodborne at E3. And what we did as the American team is that we provided creative direction to Ryan and the Japan studio facilitated communication between their music team and from software. Now, I bring this story up today because, to me, I, I feel like there is, uh, for those of you who may not have a window into this process, that it's a really uh, compelling story because what's happened with Ryan is that he's done a self-published trailer record that he distributed on iTunes and I'm sure, you know, other uh, methods of distribution. And this wound up weaving its way all the way back to, um, and I'm going to uh, get into more details about the story as it's told to me, uh, some fans of the Dark Souls series which paired this music up with some footage from Dark Souls and then that's what was presented to Miyazaki-san and that's uh, what really grabbed him. So the point here, folks, is that you know, the world is listening. And if any of you have felt as I have felt in the past as a former composer and now producer, thinking, hmm, how do I meet the right people? How do I get the projects that I would really like to be working on? I would give you this advice. Having had a window now into this process, best thing to do is focus on the music. Just do some great work, as I'm sure you all do. Put it out there because uh, folks really are listening. And I think now in the world that we have with the types of communication tools, now more than ever. So um, I felt uh, you know, some despair in the past, thinking, hmm, how do I move forward here? 
that really is the way to do it. And I encourage you all, just focus on your art for the composers that are here in the room. Uh, it, it will get heard, I promise you. All right, moving on. Uh, back to Bloodborne. And ultimately, what wound up happening with the score is that it was written by three in-house uh, Japanese composers from, from software, and they absolutely brilliant. And we had three American composers that we wound up recommending and contributing. So the challenge for us at this point was with six composers, how do we achieve a consistent sound? So, uh, and before that is, <laughs> sorry, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. What we had to do first was we had to define the sound. You know, what was going to be something that was going to be, uh, it was going to be the elements that really captured what Bloodborne was about. So we had some further discussions with the, our colleagues in Japan Studio and from software, and we talked to them, of course, of what they wanted to achieve with the score. Then we did a little bit of research, and what we wound up doing was to create something that we call a style guide. And what this is, uh, is a research project that we do. We find other scores that have been produced that we think have elements that help to define the sound that the creative team is looking to achieve. And then we present that, and then we talk about it and figure out, well, what are the elements that we feel are going to work for Bloodborne, and maybe what elements are not applicable to that. In the GDC presentation, it was discussed how Ryan Amon was discovered by Miyazaki when a fan on YouTube featured Ryan's music in a Dark Souls video. Sharing his experience, Ryan said, yes, I heard this while we were first recording the original theme for Bloodborne at Sony, outside of San Francisco. On a lunch break, one of the producers asked me if I knew where the director heard my music, and why they reached out to me. It was the first time I had heard how it all happened. It wasn't the first time this has happened, strangely enough, as Neil Blomkamp had also discovered my music this way when he called me to discuss scoring Elysium. In a business that has become all about self-promotion, I found it very interesting that a lot of my opportunities have come through fan promotion. The internet has definitely been a whole new platform for artists to get their music heard. You never know who is listening or who stumbles across your music and if something captivates or resonates with them. Almost all of my projects have come from YouTube videos that other people have posted. The host replied, Bloodborne's lore is a complex and deep topic, but there are definitely themes of faith and religion that run throughout the game's story. Did you take any inspiration from the game's world and lore when creating the music? Ryan explained. When the project was first presented to me and I was asked to submit a theme, most of my ideas were based on imagery than lore, as the nuances of the story hadn't been revealed to me yet. I was told of the disease sweeping the land and the main character's journey of survival and revelation. I think I created a short film of this in my head and scored it that way, as the opening of a film would be the main titles that used to lay the story and background before the film actually begins. I would say it's impossible for me to write music that isn't spiritually charged in some way. I'm not really aware of a way to create art without tapping into the source of where it comes from. As more of the game's story, setting, and characters were revealed to me, I was able to dig deeper into motivation and what was lurking beneath the surface. Religious rituals were definitely part of Bloodborne, and working on the church hymn was a bit unsettling, but fun to explore a style of writing with harmonic colors that normally I wouldn't be allowed to experiment with. Also, the idea of scoring the construct of fear is quite interesting, as fear often comes from a feeling of not having control, a psychologically fascinating world to explore through music. The host then asked, how did you approach capturing the game's themes of horror and despair through the music? Ryan explained, despair is a good word, there is a melancholy to the game, a loneliness that does lead to despair, I think. I guess I tried to put myself in the character's mind more than the audience's. How would I feel in an environment that is both expansive and suffocating at the same time? I personally don't like horror films, and I have a very hard time watching them. Thankfully, the game's images weren't as visceral as a film would portray them, and I tried to write music that was a struggle within the mind rather than physically. The choral moments were, yes, traditional in one facet, but the reason I included them was to represent more of a collective lamentation of humanity as a whole. One facet is a ceremonial choir that seems to encourage the hunter during battle. The other facet, a religious battle over the soul of the hunter. 
another facet the female soloist representing the frailty and loneliness of the mission, while at the same time having the duality of peace and calm that will ultimately come either with death or victory or both. For those who have never played Bloodborne, have no intent of playing it, and are watching this video just to know more about its creation, it would be an injustice if you don't experience its music. So please enjoy this next section, where the Swedish Radio Symphony Orchestra plays the music of Ryan Amon for Bloodborne.
Ryan Amon is not the sole exceptional composer behind the Bloodborne soundtrack. We also have Tsukasa Saito, Yuka Kitamura, Nobuyoshi Suzuki, Chris Velasco, and Michael Wanmacher contributing to its brilliance. When asked about their experiences working on the Bloodborne soundtrack, Tsukasa Saito mentioned, We drew on the key words of mortal struggle and horror, which were determined at the beginning of development, and also built up an image from things like the boss and map designs. In order to express the early modern Victorian setting, we decided to rule out organ, woodwind instruments, and certain brass instruments, such as trumpet, and so on. Rather than something grandiose, we aimed for a black and withered atmosphere. Yuka Kitamura added, While composing the music for Ebrietas, daughter of the cosmos, I sensed themes of the universe, of finality, of something godly, and I was filled with visions of the end of the world as I worked on that song. Nobuyoshi Suzuki shared his insights, saying, The design and backstory had a large effect on me. The One Reborn, whose music I was in charge of composing, is a ghastly figure of ritual mass sacrifice, and so the feeling of horror and of something disgusting was the underlying premise, with greater themes of adornment and royalty. So I started with the simple image of using deep bass instrument riffs to invoke a sense of royalty and the choir to express adornment and began composing from there. Six days after the release of the soundtrack recording, Sony unveiled the first official story trailer for Bloodborne. Welcome home, good hunter. What is it you desire? Yarnum is the home of blood ministration. You need only unravel its mystery. But where's an outsider like yourself to begin? Easy, with a bit of Yarnum blood of your own. Whatever happens, you may think it all a mere bad dream. Long ago, old Yarnum was overrun by the plague of beasts and left to rot and decay. And now the only voices heard there are the howls of beasts. The blood satiates us, soothes our fears, but beware, the frailty of men. The blood makes us human, makes us more than human, makes us human no more. Good hunter, your presence somehow soothes. What is it you desire? <coughs> and so, the hunt begins again. As we rapidly approached the game's release date, on March 2nd, just a few weeks before the game's launch, Sony also released a Bloodborne TV commercial. Rated M for Mature. We are born of the blood. Made men by the blood. Undone by the blood. You can all run if you want to. You can all hide if you need. But I'm gonna cut you down. On March 12th, just a few days before the release of Bloodborne, Sony held a completion announcement event for the game at the Akihabara UDX Theater. 
This event was attended by members of the media and selected players chosen through a lottery from applicants to participate in the presentation and demo sessions. Notable figures, including SCE Japan Asia President Atsushi Morita, SCE Worldwide Studios President Shuhei Yoshida, and from Software's Hidetaka Miyazaki, were all present at the event. The event kicked off with the screening of a promotional video for Bloodborne. Following that, Atsushi Morita delivered a speech highlighting the success of the PlayStation 4, with over 20 million units sold worldwide within a year of its release in Japan. He emphasized the recent surge in sales attributed to the release of significant titles and positioned Bloodborne as the pinnacle of these releases. Shuhei Yoshida then took the stage to deliver a speech, stating, I'm genuinely delighted to be here with all of you today. I receive messages on my Twitter almost every day saying, I want to play Bloodborne soon, and I can feel the high expectations from the users. We've worked hard to surpass the expectations of From Software fans and Miyazaki fans worldwide and to deliver a high-quality game. Finally, Miyazaki was invited on stage to give a brief message. This being From Software's first title for the PlayStation 4, we faced various challenges, but we have finally reached completion. I am grateful to many people, including the staff at SCE, for helping us achieve this. On behalf of the development team, I would like all of the users to experience the ultimate battle of Bloodborne. Thank you for your support. After the speeches, another promotional video was shown, followed by a gameplay demo conducted by the game's producer, Masaki Yamagiwa, and the promotional representative, Yasuhiro Kitao. Kitao then announced several collaborations related to Bloodborne, including a special program that would air on TV Tokyo before the game's release. He also unveiled an upcoming Bloodborne figure, created by Gecko, scheduled to be released three months after the game's launch. Following the figure announcement, the Bloodborne original soundtrack was revealed. This soundtrack would include songs from the game and would be released on April 22nd. After the presentations, attendees were given the opportunity to play the game. Four days before the actual release date, Sony unveiled a new trailer titled Cut You Down. Three days before the release of Bloodborne, PlayStation Denmark partnered with GiveBlood to offer copies of the game to individuals who donated blood during an event on March 23rd at the ITU in Copenhagen. Furthermore, there was another draw open to those who donated blood or had their blood tested during the event, with a unique Bloodborne-themed PlayStation 4 as the prize. Now that we have reached the month of Bloodborne's release, it's time to explore the major features of the game that made it into the production version. We previously discussed in the game development section how Bloodborne distinguishes itself by being faster and more aggressive than the preceding Souls games. However, these changes also extend to the game's enemies, spanning from humble dogs to formidable bosses. Every creature in Bloodborne, regardless of its size, has been meticulously crafted to dispatch the player swiftly and in the most gruesome manner. According to Miyazaki, this was one of their core intentions. He explained, Most of the enemies are strong and terrifying. If you remain passive, you'll quickly be overwhelmed and killed. That's why the basic concept is to confront these fearsome enemies actively and desperately carve out your path. 
Whether it's the world or the enemies, we want players to feel that everything is darker and more terrifying. Regarding battles, we want players to experience them as more brutal and deadly struggles. We don't necessarily want to create a horror game, but we believe these emotions are suitable for this game. If I were to make a comparison, it's similar to the atmosphere of Tower of Latria in Demon's Souls. One of the unique features introduced in Bloodborne is the regain mechanic, which allows you to recover lost health for a limited time after sustaining damage. Miyazaki elaborated on this feature, stating, After taking damage, if you counterattack, you can regain the health you lost. It's a dynamic, strategic component that involves decision-making. The design intended to bring about intense battles and bolster the impression of lethal combat. The notion of deadly combat is a primary theme in our game's battles, and regain is a vital element that bolsters this concept. Therefore, I hope it resonates well with players. The combat in Bloodborne is so aggressive that Miyazaki made the decision to dedicate a specific button for healing, as it can mean the difference between life and death in the midst of intense battles. In contrast to other Souls games, where the healing item is grouped with other consumables, requiring players to scroll through choices to locate it. Miyazaki clarified, On a broader scale, we're contemplating assigning HP recovery to a single button. This is partly due to our desire for smoother HP recovery within the context of active and dynamic battles. Moreover, for many players, HP recovery is often the most critical aspect, and when item selection defaults to HP recovery, it can restrict the diversity of tactical choices involving other items. We aim to address this concern. One of the primary distinguishing features of Bloodborne in comparison to other Souls games is the inclusion of trick weapons. These weapons offer two distinct forms, a standard form and a transformed form, allowing players to switch between them in the midst of combat. Each trick weapon possesses its own unique moveset and characteristics in both forms, enabling players to adapt to diverse situations and playstyles. Miyazaki elaborated, stating, the weapon transformation serves a purpose beyond merely introducing a gimmick or underscoring the concept of hunters using specialized weapons for beast hunting. It's primarily about enhancing gameplay. While mastering a single weapon, we wanted to offer players different choices and tactical options compared to conventional weaponry. The game features an array of distinctive weapons with various gimmicks, and the enjoyment derives from how you employ them to navigate the captivating exploration spaces. While the trick weapons are a fascinating innovation in Bloodborne, it's quite noticeable that there are significantly fewer weapons in this game compared to the other Souls titles. In an interview, the host raised a question. There's been some concern among Souls fans on the web regarding the suggestion that Bloodborne won't feature as many weapons as the Souls games. Could you clarify how the weapon system operates in Bloodborne? Hidetaka Miyazaki responded, In terms of the number of physical weapons, there are indeed fewer compared to a Souls game, but this is, to a certain extent, a decision influenced by the game's design. The unique aspect of Bloodborne's weapons is their transformation. A single weapon can serve various purposes and strategies. Additionally, you have the ability to customize your weapon with blood gems, with various types available, and up to three can be slotted at a time. For instance, one gem might reduce the stamina consumption per swing, the customization options offer numerous combinations, so, in a way, the variety present in Souls is integrated into Bloodborne through this customization element, allowing players to tailor their weapons to their preferred playstyle. The diversity may not manifest in the sheer quantity of weapons, but rather in the depth of customization, much more than in Souls. As for the question about his favorite weapon in Bloodborne, Miyazaki responded, A favorite weapon, you say? Well, that's a tough one. But if I had to choose, I'd go with the Threaded Cane. It's among the most challenging of the starting weapons to wield effectively, but I appreciate its design and that touch of sophistication it exudes. That's why it comes with a slightly higher price tag. One of the new features introduced in Bloodborne is the inclusion of firearms, a type of weapon not found in other Souls games. However, these firearms are not limited to the player character. Enemies also wield them, often with deadly efficiency. Miyazaki explained, Firearms are designed to be effectively utilized in close quarters combat. The firearms introduced are primarily shotguns for this purpose. While long-range sniping is possible, it's not very effective. Firearms truly come into their own when used in close combat, specifically for counterattacks. 
disrupting groups of approaching enemies, or creating opportunities during melee engagements. Our aim is to fine-tune them in this direction. Chalice dungeons are a distinctive feature in Bloodborne, introducing an extra layer of gameplay and challenge to the overall experience. These dungeons are optional and procedurally generated, providing players with the opportunity to explore the depths beneath the city of Yarnum. During an interview, the host inquired about the origins of Chalice Dungeons, asking, You mentioned the Chalice Dungeons earlier. Were those inspired by Rogue or NetHack or some of the other roguelikes you've played? Miyazaki explained, The concept for the Chalice Dungeons actually originated from a somewhat different source. Initially, I believe that with the type of games we create, which are known for their difficulty and the enjoyment derived from strategic approaches, it's challenging to surpass the element of surprise you encounter when playing a game for the first time. That period when you're navigating new and unfamiliar challenges, sharing your experiences with others, and engaging in discussions about various aspects of the game. Such enjoyment naturally has its limits, but we wondered if there was a way to sustain it, even if only in a virtual manner. That was the initial spark for the Chalice Dungeon idea. As a result, Chalice Dungeons constitute a completely separate system within the game. The diversity within each dungeon, achieved by utilizing different elements in the generation process to maintain freshness, and the ability to preserve a dungeon after generating it to share with others, are both concepts that originated from that original idea. While many role-playing games have dungeons with changing structures each time you play, this approach doesn't facilitate the sharing and strategizing with others. For a game like this one, rooted in the concept of learning from your surroundings and exploiting them to overcome challenges, making these dungeons shareable was essential. Working on Chalice Dungeons in this game has piqued my interest in so-called procedural games, exploring where this kind of approach might lead. It's worth noting that Chalice Dungeons are not strictly procedural in nature, however. Blood Gems are a new feature introduced in Bloodborne, and they are used to customize and enhance weapon performance by adding various effects and bonuses. These effects may include increased physical damage, elemental damage, improved scaling with your character's attributes, and various secondary effects, such as increased rally potential or reduced stamina consumption. Blood Gems can have a significant impact on your character's combat abilities, making them a valuable aspect of the game's mechanics. Finally, Bloodborne was released worldwide on March 24, 2015, receiving widespread critical acclaim. It garnered praise for its punishing yet rewarding gameplay, stunning art direction, and intricate level design. Critics hailed it as a masterpiece and a defining title for the PlayStation 4. In terms of review scores from critics, it stands as the only Souls game to match the score achieved by Dark Souls 2 until Elden Ring was released and surpassed them both. Bloodborne achieved remarkable sales figures, with 152,000 physical retail copies sold in its first week of release in Japan. It secured the top spot on the Japanese software sales charts for that particular week. Unfortunately, we can't directly compare these figures with the previous Souls games, as the available data only includes physical sales and doesn't account for digital sales. However, the sales trend demonstrates that Bloodborne outperformed all the other Souls games it succeeded by a significant margin. Shortly after its release, Sony expressed that Bloodborne's sales exceeded their expectations. On April 15th, Sony issued a press release to celebrate the game surpassing 1 million units sold worldwide, a feat achieved in less than a month after its release. The press release from Sony stated, It did surprise us. We had expectations to do well. We looked at the Souls series as a frame of reference and we thought we could do better than that. We did, and then some. Relative to some of our sister territories, we were being quite ambitious, but even that proved to be conservative. Even Xbox executive Phil Spencer acknowledged and congratulated Sony and From Software for the success of Bloodborne. Following the release of Bloodborne, Sony organized community events as part of their efforts to promote the game and engage with the Souls community. Just a few days after the game's release, on March 29th, a Bloodborne community event took place in London.
thanks so much for coming. You are the guys that we've been working very hard to get excited and, and showcase the game, and we really appreciate your attendance. Bloodborne means to me, this is what it means to me right now. I don't want to be answering this question. I want to be playing the game that's just there. It's so cruel. I love every bit. I get shivers when I hear the name. <laughs> really excited to try it out. Just the whole, whole horror feel of it. The three competitors at the end of the session who have the most blood echoes will win all of this move. One, please put down your controller. I didn't think to actually win first place. It's one of the greatest thing I'll ever have because it's a memory. It's something I will ever, ever remember forever. It's amazing. One day later, Sony released the Accolades trailer for Bloodborne. Two weeks after the London event, another Bloodborne community event was held in Toronto. So good. So good. Like, there was no doubt in my mind it was going to be good, but it's so good. I had expectations, but it actually blew me away a little bit. I love every aspect of it. It's fast, it's dirty, it's just action-packed. My god, everything in the game feels perfect. It's awesome. I've never felt more vindicated for having pre-ordered a game than I do now. Uh, it's much less predictable. Um, just overall, it's a, it's a great heart-pounding experience. You, you, you get into it and they don't really tell you where to go, they don't really tell you what to do, and you just have to find your own way. And even though you keep getting killed multiple times, you just want to get better and better at it. The regain system really makes you want to get up in people's faces and really go after them. If you sit back, you're going to get crushed. I really enjoyed the weapons. I, I loved uh, that there's guns now. That's pretty interesting. The speed of the weapons is something I really enjoyed. It's something I think they finally got right in this game. I like the fact that when you transform, they feel different. I like the fact that it didn't seem tacked on. It seemed like it was like tastefully well done. And it seemed like transforming is going to be a big actual part of the game and not just like an extra. The music kicking in, the boss jumping over the ramparts, it's so extreme and it just gets you in the mood like it's its impossible not to feel something when, you, when it happens. I got really close to being the boss and I actually thought, I got a chance at this. And all of a sudden the, the, the little pitter patter in my heart kicked up and well, I, I had to play it again. And I just haven't had that feeling for a game in a very long time. It feels so modern. It feels like the future of what an action RPG should be. I feel like Souls has this ability to bring people together in a way that old games used to, that no games do anymore, really, where like you and your buddies would have to share information with each other. And I was around this TV with these guys, and we were all telling each other where things were and how to... Three months after the release of Bloodborne, Shuhei Yoshida himself shared his experience in achieving Bloodborne's Platinum Trophy, a rare achievement even among some members of the Souls community.
Hello, my friends, and welcome back to PlayStation Underground, a very special episode of PlayStation Underground, because I am joined by the president of Sony Computer Entertainment Worldwide Studios, Mr. Shuhei Yoshida. Hello, sir. Hello. And I am also joined by my colleague and friend, Justin Massengill, Hello. Our, uh, one of our resident Bloodborne experts here in the office. And we are playing the Japanese version of Bloodborne, which uh, is on Shuhei Yoshida's account, uh, and we are going to play a save data file of his in which he has loaded up a chalice dungeon for your amusement. So, Yoshida-san, yep. how about we jump right in, and as you start playing, you can tell us a little bit about your experience with Bloodborne. Yeah, so uh, I platinumed it. Uh, I spent you know countless hours playing it, but I couldn't stop playing it. And uh, <laughs> this is my second platinum trophy ever, actually. And my Nonsense. first first ever was Hannah Montana, the movie, <laughs> the game. <laughs> yes, on PS3. <laughs> like uh, back in the days when I joined the uh, uh, podcast Beyond crew, <laughs> you know, when they learned that I didn't have any uh, platinum trophies, you know, Greg Mia and the crew sent me a copy of Hannah Montana. So that uh, I got the very easy. <laughs> you know, it took me like four or five hours to get the platinum. <laughs> you gotta have a platinum on you. But now, yeah, yeah, yeah. but Bloodborne requires yeah. significantly more effort. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. that, so this is my second platinum. So I wanted to show, you know, the hardest boss ever to get the platinum. Oh it's boy. in the second layer of the Defile Child's Dungeon Tumor. It's a four steps. And uh, it gets your HP halved. Oh. So that's the hardest boss. And I think uh, I will be beaten. And, you know, it took me so many countless you know, trials. Uh, but uh, I'll get you know, uh, all of us try. To try it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll we'll um, give it a shot. I don't know if we'll be able to hang yeah. with, uh, with your skill level, but we can try. And this is, this is your Shizu-san's So this character. is my character. <laughs> yeah, a very popular outfit. And What's uh, your character's name? Um, uh, YOSP, I, I oh, okay. guess. <laughs> yeah. So sorry about this you know, Japanese you know, interface. You know, I, I've been playing the Japanese version. But uh, my level is 172. But when I beat this boss the first time, uh, I was about 130 or 140. Wow. And uh, after I got the uh, platinum, you know, when I got the platinum, I was level 150. But uh, wow. after that, I kept playing. Bloodborne was awarded the 2015 Game of the Year by several video game review sites, including Game Trailers, Eurogamer, Destructoid, and Edge. However, the most anticipated event for the gaming community was the Game Awards. Bloodborne was pitted against a formidable opponent, The Witcher 3. Even Shuhei Yoshida cheered for it on Twitter. Uh, well, we've got uh, one big award left tonight. It is Game of the Year. That's right. And what an amazing year it's been for games, right? And we've got some huge epic role-playing games uh, nominated. We've got something fun like Super Mario Maker. It's such a great year for games. And what I love about this business and why we keep doing this show is that every year, gaming is this intersection of entertainment and technology. And every year, the games get better. So uh, from you know developers in Maryland to uh, Warsaw, Tokyo, Kyoto, games are developed around the world. And we have a truly global industry, and we want to welcome everyone watching around the world, all you tweeting me that you're up at 4 a.m. in the morning in Europe watching this show. Thank you for sticking around. Um, it just shows the power and promise of gaming. So here are your nominees for Game of the Year. It's finally time for Game of the Year. You guys ready? 
Fan choice. And the winner for Game of the Year 2015 is The Witcher 3. The competition continued at the 2016 BAFTA Games Awards, where the two games faced off once more. Game Design Bloodborne Grow Home Her Story Yeah that's me. But February, I mean, that was months ago. What's that got to do with Simon's murder? Lovers in a dangerous space time. Rocket League. The Witcher 3, Wild Hunt. The BAFTA for game design goes to Bloodborne. I'd just like to uh, thank uh, Hidetaka Miyazaki, who's the game director. Um, unfortunately, he couldn't uh, make it out here tonight. He's literally like the busiest man we know. He's also the CEO of uh, the very, very talented uh, studio from software. And as you all know, they just, uh, you know, they've wrapped up work on Dark Souls 3, and I think it's uh, coming out here next week, uh, which is also, uh, available to play on PlayStation 4. Last time I checked, <laughs> PS4 was still the best place to play. <laughs> um, and also, I'd just like to thank uh, these two guys here, um, Yamagiwa-san and Toriyama-san, uh, who's joining me tonight, and um, all the people back in Sony Japan studio, all our colleagues in America, Europe, and of course uh, here in the UK, and all their friends and families. Without them, uh, this game couldn't have been possible. And last but not least, uh, all the fans and all the Bloodborne players uh, watching, uh, you know, all the passion and the love of this game and since it's been out, it's been incredible. And it makes all those uh, very, very long days and nights and the countless hours that we all put into it so worthwhile so thank you very much as a final note about the making of bloodborne when asked about the legacy of the game miyazaki stated that's a tough question to be frank it all boils down to having fun no matter what kind of legacy or reputation this title leaves a decade down the road if the players had fun playing it I'll be more than satisfied. <laughs>